Um, I'm Hayes Williams. Uh, I'm happy you're here. I wanted to let you know the first thing I was instructed to do was let you know that if I say something really wackadoodle up here, the company does not have my back. So I just want you, <laughs> want you collectively to know that. Um, I will begin by telling you kind of what the whole point of what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, just so that you can have the choice, right? So um, I have found and I believe that uh, gamers and YouTube, uh, uh, YouTubers effectively use video to convey their messages, to convey their energy uh, and their experiences. And I think that uh, while we use video in kind of a uh, training in a kind of limited capacity in, in corporate America now, I think it's time to start bringing that more into our data management, our data governance programs to sort of use it as another mechanism in addition to the meetings, in addition to the training, in addition to everything you kind of already do, also use video to enrich the communication, to enrich the engagement. So that's the whole point. So if you get the point, you're comfortable, you're welcome to kind of be free and, and, and find another one. If you want to stay with me, um, I want to tell you a little bit about me, my role in my company, what problem I'm trying to solve, a little bit about the origin to what I just said. Uh, and I'm a big believer in kind of, in addition to meetings, as I was saying, asynchronous methods, the kind of out of time band, the stuff where you're not face to face to augment the face to face. Legal and privacy, whenever you talk about video, has to come in. I'll mention it, you know, spend a few moments about it. Uh, I want to talk about the difficulty of some of this has come way down. I want to talk about how you can do it, create a video, uh, distribute a video, consume a video, other methods of kind of out of band uh, communications things, which I think really help. Um, and then I do have some examples, or excuse me, talk a few. Um, what this might evolve into in five, 10 years, whatever it happens to be. And I do have a couple of examples if we get to it, depending on the timing. Um, so I'm Hayes Williams, as I said. Um, I spent a lot of time in consulting. Uh, most of the themes uh, that I've had end up to be data related and research and development, farm R&D. Um, I uh, started sort of the focused role in data governance at Celgene uh, BMS ended up uh, buying Celgene, which kind of interrupted the plans we had put down. And then Daichi Sankyo, a Japanese company, uh, pulled me out of the LinkedIn sea. I have been at Daichi Sankyo about a year and a half. Um, a lot of that has been, uh, you know, startup. You hear this term, army of one. Like right now, I think Daichi Sankyo knows they need to do more with data governance in, in general. Um, they need to learn and kind of understand what, uh, where they want to go with it, and that's what I've been helping uh, uh, start up. Um, I did take the liberty of putting the, the reference to the certification up, simply because there's only about, you know, this room will go, oh, most of the rest of the places in the world will go, what is that? So I just want to take the opportunity to get it, uh, to, to put it out there. This is the set of bullet points I use the derive from my job description, uh, and I don't want you necessarily to read them as much as see that the first bullet point is what you would expect. Create a data governance program, uh, manage it, kind of uh, manage data as an asset for the organization. Exactly what you kind of expect from uh, the title and role. The other four bullets that are at the top of my list all really revolve around education, advocating, change management. How do you get people to understand what you're asking and kind of do something new, something different, take a different position, a different understanding? So in a certain sense, 80% of my role is really education, communication, training, and you know, by this metric, 20% of my role is kind of doing what you would expect me to do. So a lot of what I think about is how can I engage the group, the stakeholders that I'm interested in, in some way that will get them to listen. That's kind of the genesis to, to what, I'm talk, what I'm after. Every um, consulting company in, uh, the, uh, in this uh, hall and in the, the subsequent halls have their own capability maps. You almost certainly have your own capability map. 
Um, I couldn't use the capability maps that I'd used for many years at the consulting uh, world, just you know, intellectual property law, thing like that, right? So I spent some time uh, trying to put together what I thought the key pieces were. And I think I won't you know, spend much time with this because I've seen variations of a theme uh, across the way. But the key thing, besides being business-led, you know, having an organization that makes choices or decisions around data, having data capabilities to support it, guidelines, you know, data sharing, uh, standards, policies, and embedding with the organization is people. Like every capability map has a discussion about people and whether that's training, communications, um, I, I'm missing one, but that kind of engagement to, uh, uh, to get people to change, to do uh, to the point of view and to the actions you want. Oop, wrong button, there we go. Um, Daichi Sankyo is a big company. It's, it's uh, 16,000 people uh, uh, worldwide, 20 countries, uh, so, and it's been around for like 100 years. So it is a big company. You may or may not have heard of it, and I completely understand that, uh, but it's, it's quite large. It is, however, small in the sense that they've recently uh, moved into the, cardio, into the uh, oncology space. Uh, and maybe the last four or five years, uh, they've been building up what we, we, we believe is a very successful pipeline in oncology. And in doing that, they've had to create a lot of the core capabilities, a lot of the, um, it, the change in this organization has been tremendous. New drugs, new capabilities, new uh, people, new org structures just a lot of change in the organization that they're managing through right this moment. And I will tell you that I have worked for multinationals for most of my professional career, and I bet most of you have worked with multinationals for most of your career. But I haven't worked in uh, a, a Jap Japan-led uh, company where uh, the time difference is 13 hours, uh, it's 14 hours now with uh, daylight savings time, but that creates some problems, right? Essentially, every meeting I have to align with Japanese colleagues occurs between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. and equivalent hours for them. And essentially, every meeting is inconvenient for everybody on the phone. You know, it's just a hard way to do. And it is not negotiable to, to not have these meetings. You have to align with your uh, Japan colleagues. There, there's no way around it. So the whole thing I've been kind of thinking about is, can we at least uh, record what ends up happening is you spend 40 minutes or 45 minutes in a meeting describing what you think this group should do. We, we propose that we do you know, A, B, C, here's the things that go into that, here's what I think you should do, here's what I think I should do, and you spend 15 minutes at the end of it uh, talking about, you know, do you agree with that, uh, aligning on it, reaching consensus, and that's sort of the wrong proportion, if you will. You have to get your point across, you have to uh, spend your time kind of getting uh, alignment, but I would rather, especially for the global meetings, to make it more about conversation than presentation. So if you put some of the, uh, uh, some of the meeting materials like the PowerPoint in with the video beforehand so they can see it during uh, their kind of normal business hours, then you can spend more time talking about the ideas and reaching alignment. Because if you don't do that, the first thing you do after the um, 15 minutes worth of conversation is schedule another meeting to finish the conversation. So that's kind of my problem. Like that this is, this is where, why I started doing what, we're, what I'm talking about doing here. But it might not necessarily be your problem. So I have a different question for you. What do you believe your biggest constraint, your biggest blocker in starting up, managing your data governance, data quality, I, they're all the same, your program. Just, we'll see if we, I mean, we've had a lot of it. So give me some ideas. What do you think the biggest blocker is? 
Go. Lacking of understanding of what it is or what uh, someone in a certain role has to do. It, it takes very long for someone to say, oh, this is what I really need to do on the test. Lack of understanding. Excellent. You didn't fall into my trap. Any other answers? People. People. Uh, also a good answer. The one I was hoping someone would say is money. money. Yes, exactly. Uh, I, I, I believe those are all good answers. I believe money is an important constraint, but I don't think it's the biggest blocker. I would suggest to you that the biggest blocker is attention. The thing about we as a group uh, think about data, data quality, data governance. We think about this as our day jobs. Like This is what we do. Um, but the people whose behavior we want to change have a day job themselves. They spend most of their time thinking about whatever business process that they, they have or what they're doing. Um, and you have to kind of uh, work with that. You are always fighting for their attention. Oops. So I'm going to go and make a, a, a quick detour, right? My son's a gamer, and I, I, um, I, he's sort of, I'm listening to him, kind of watching what he, he did. Another fun thing. Who knows who Ninja is? One, two, right? Exactly. So he is the, he, he, he started playing uh, Fortnite and streaming, uh, and he, uh, First he plays, then he uh, takes clips of his best moments and puts them on YouTube um, so that people can come afterwards if they missed his original stream or if they, um, if they want to see the highlight reel, for example. And then people watch. Um, he makes a lot of money. That's not actually my point, but it is an interesting statement. So uh, if you want to uh, be entertained with that. The thing that I want um, you guys to think about is they feel his energy and they make a connection with him. Um, and they rewatch the clips that uh, they missed or they rewatch seg segments that he's missed. And I I'd ask you, you know, why is that relevant? Uh, I believe, and I will uh, propose to you, that in their videos and live streams, gamers transfer their energy and passion for the game to you as you watch. They demonstrate their learnings, their learnings and their strategy around how to work with the game, and their advanced strategy. Um, they have evergreen content, so new members, new people who are coming in have some place to go to kind of learn uh, more about their game. And they have the content available uh, they have the content available to the watcher when the watcher is ready to consume it instead of when you're ready to give it, right? And I really, I mean, all those bullet points to me feel relevant to our day jobs. We want to transfer, we want people to believe what we believe and do what we're asking them to do. And I believe this is one way to, to go after it. It is super common in the business world right this moment to say, send me the deck, right? So this, what I'm proposing to you, has to be better than sending the deck, right? I can, I can put the deck in the email uh, with no problem. People understand what to do with that. They flip through it and they go. I would suggest to you that making a video in addition to the deck, reviewing the material for the people who you're trying to reach adds a couple of things. It adds you, for starters, right? So your passion, your energy, your interest. Uh, it adds context. When we go through a, a PowerPoint like this, right? I add stories, overview, um, color, you know, color commentary, if you will. I add a lot of um, extra information and I have the ability to focus the listener's attention on the points that I'm mo most interested in. When people flip through the deck, they get a sense of the material, but I would suggest to you they don't 
engage with the material like you want them to. They just look at it and they say, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, it's, it's fine, I got it. Um, and then you go in and you end up repeating the material in the PowerPoint anyway. If you have this kind of mechanism to go through and help them understand uh, and focus on the points you're interested in, add the stories and add the interest, I think it's a more effective uh, way of engaging without really doing the face-to-face -face thing. Just a much richer uh, communication method. So I don't believe this should be everywhere in the organization. You shouldn't do everything with video. I think, at least from my perspective and my use cases, what I'm trying to target is overview or kickoff materials, like those long presentations to set the stage. Um, long presentations, like I was saying at the, a, a few slides ago, to sort of help, um, uh, help present the idea, present the argument, present the detail so that you can have a conversation later. Status meetings or similar regular update type meetings. And I have to tell you, if I can help kill status meetings, I will consider myself helping humanity. So that's certainly something I, I believe would be good for our, our, our culture. Summaries of meeting outcomes, right? You get 40 people in a meeting, you really only need 15, but the balance of people should be informed of the outcome. That's fine, but they don't need to sit in the meeting, right? That's, that's kind of... Uh, uh, the use cases and extra material, which might not be central to the decision-making process, but useful to the audience, uh, and you know, future uh, materials. That kind of use case, that kind of idea is what I'm going after. I will say I am blowing through this just because you know the clock is ticking at me. But if there are questions, comments, please, you know, no, no problem, anytime. So you can have this conversation without talking about legal and privacy. Every, I suspect, every one of your uh, business standards, uh, corporate culture somewhere has a, a statement similar to this uh, in your, uh, uh, your code of business practices, whatever you happen to name that. Essentially, the intent to it is very simple. Um, don't just record meetings, especially where people are talking and forming opinions. And you know, in fairness to the lawyers and in fairness to the, uh, to the um, uh, people who wrote those policies, that's a good idea. You don't want to uh, inhibit people from having open conversations. People form opinions, they have to knock them up against each other, um, and it presents some pretty large risk of uh, if that video was, uh, put into the field, right, the, of it being misinterpreted, misrepresented, because people haven't had a chance to think through the uh, material themselves yet. That's what the meeting is for. Uh, I don't think that's the end. Like right now, I think most of the comments around video are written in a very binary fashion. They really look at the worst case and then write the policies towards the worst case. And what I'd suggest to you is that we need a bit more of a nuanced uh, strategy around video to enable these kind of uh, use cases. And, you know, not a lawyer, not um, really uh, telling you this is what it has to be, but I think it would sound something like first saying, you know what, you're right, don't record meetings without consent, that one stays, right, that, no, no doubt about it. Another one would be, you know, videos are documents, so they have to obey all the same rules and regulations that our documents currently, um, uh, currently obey, like um, retention schedules, like it has to be in a repository uh, that is controlled by the company where the access is controlled and all the other rules are, are, are obeyed. If you want to see your legal department throw up a little in their mouth, tell them you're using YouTube, right? That's, uh, that, that'll, it'll be like four seconds before they come after you if you do that. So it has to obey all of the uh, rules and regulations that any document in your company already uh, obeys. And I think at the end, you have to be able to say, here's what's okay to do with video. 
uh, the, the kind of use cases I was suggesting to go uh, record the portion of your presentation that's gonna take 35 minutes, let people look at it in advance, to record the, uh, uh, the status meetings so that you don't have to get 30 people on the phone uh, each person gives an update and then there's this awkward silence between every person when people ask for questions and nothing happens, right? To get those kind of things gone from the corporate environment. Oh, uh, I didn't lead into that one, but um, one of the things I had, as I started to think about this for my own use, uh, the effort to do this has dropped tremendously. And if you want to make a video, all you need is PowerPoint. And this one, I don't know, maybe you knew it. Uh, I didn't know it. If you go in and add the recording bar in PowerPoint, you can make a video right off your webcam. You can, you can write it to your uh, computer, you know, just as simple as can be. PowerPoint is sufficient to make a video like what I'm talking about. Um, I did do a... Um, uh, uh, so, I, as I was looking at what was available, a pharma company has a locked desktop uh, on purpose, right, because you need to control the network access and all, all that kind of thing. So, I wanted, I look for these two conditions. What is a zero dollar cost to create a video and what do I have available on my laptop now? I found five more things, including just the simple record, use whatever, um, we use MS Teams as an example, but maybe you use Zoom or WebEx or whatever, you can re just record straight off of that. So there are, in, in truth, once you start looking at the, uh, looking at the uh, what you have on your desktop and what's available quickly, there's no shortage of tools. You just have to figure out what works best in your environment. Because I guarantee you it's different uh, between my environment and your environment but I also guarantee you that there will be a lot of options once you start looking at it and start asking the question, you know, what can I do? Um, the last one is really kind of, I, 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 I don't know, I, I, I mentioned it um, just because I thought it was so uh, um, interesting. The gamers use a very specific type of software. Uh, uh, there's two flavors of it, uh, frankly. But the point to the software is a very um, detailed way to uh, uh, manage your desktop. You can put, you know, you can put a title bar, you can put a background, you can put uh, your face in one spot and as big as you want. Um, you can do the, you can buy $50, pay $50 to get a green screen and make your floating head kind of uh, uh, effect. All that kind of stuff. It's free. Um, it's free because they want you to use the streaming service. We <laughs> won't use the streaming service as such uh, because it'll go into some kind of public domain, but using the record functionality gives you a very, very granular control on how you, uh, how you make your video, how you make your recording. And you can do a lot of very clever things like have interview two people on and, and things. I just, I don't know if I'm necessarily recommending it other than if you want to get crazy with this, it's a great, great tool to get crazy with. I mentioned how to edit the video just because people, uh, Adobe Premiere is 80 times too complex for business users. It's not kind of worth the effort for what I think I'm advocating. What I'm really looking for are, you know, clip off the ends, you know, cut two pieces together, put a title page on, and you're done. Like, we, we in the business world don't have time uh, or interest in making this a production. We want to communicate the idea, we want to make it look professional, but it doesn't have to be much more than that. And there are also a lot of options for doing that. Now, with a locked desktop, you know, you're going to have to work some this is, you'll, you will have to ask IT for, for help, I would imagine, to uh, pick the right software to see what happens, but there's a lot of options out there to make it, make it very simple. Um, I have two things, I don't know. Uh, distribution, 
Some corporate cultures will have like a, a, a Vimeo or something where you can upload your video uh, and it's globally available. Uh, we don't as of yet have that. So what I end up, you have to think about how the people are gonna receive it. Um, in my case, if I put a video uh, on a server in the US, uh, the Japan folks aren't going to be able to see it. The EU people are gonna have a degraded performance. So in my specific case, what I end up doing is uploading a video to two or three places so that the people in their region can see it with some good performance. This may or may not be what you would have to do if you took a choice, uh, uh, started to embrace something like this. Uh, but you do have to think about it. You have to think about how are the people who are receiving the video, how are they going to get at it, and will it be sufficient, you know, will it be a performance? It doesn't have to be perfect. Like, no one expects perfection, but it has to be good enough, if you will. And I think this one for me, right, it sounds counterintuitive because we all know how to watch a video, but the in the business day, uh, you schedule meeting, schedule meeting, schedule meeting, schedule meeting. You don't ever, right this moment, block a bit of time to watch your video, right? That, that doesn't happen, and you kind of have to. Um, there's, um, to make a method like this work, people, the culture has to be accustomed to the idea that this, I'm gonna spend an hour in the day, and I'm gonna keep it blocked off and I'm gonna catch up on the media and the, the uh, information that's out there so that I can be prepared. It's sort of like meeting prep. It's like clear meeting prep time. Um, and you need to enforce that so that you can uh, uh, more or less get the value out of going through the overhead of doing something like this. Um, and notes, right? Uh, as people are watching the video, they're gonna have questions, comments, uh, ideas themselves, you need to give them some way to record or, or add their, their thoughts to the video. Not necessarily to the video, to, to the notes around it. I think the killer reason uh, why video makes good sense is because on the receiving end, you can play back at 1.5 speed or 1.8 speed, much faster than, a than a, uh, in, per in person. So if you're in a four hour meeting and there's two hours worth of presentation uh, in today's world, and you get that two hours worth of presentation in advance, you can watch that 50% faster than you could if you were sitting in the meeting. And you can skip around, right? You can move forward or move backwards. It gives you a lot more uh, uh, flexibility in understanding and getting through the content. And, you know, we have so much, uh, if I could choose between an hour meeting, listening to a person like me, and getting a video uh, where I could watch that same content in 33% less time if I did my math right, right? There, there's a lot of uh, power uh, behind being able to get some of these concepts out faster and more easily. And you really don't you lose anything. Really, the, the days where the, you sound like a chipmunk are, are long gone. So I encourage you to try it the next time you're, um, you're watching your own video. So I really kind of um, uh, shorted uh, talking about survey and chat and microblogging um, and all the other kind of asynchronous communication styles. And I kind of shorted it because I think those are better known. B video is used in our environment, but it's used less than some of these other uh, tools. But I think the whole message is in addition to the meeting, uh, in addition to what, doing what we all do, schedule a meeting, you know, go over the materials, Using all of these tools, like a survey, like a microblog, like uh, everything that can be done so that the listener can look at and think about that material in their own time, when they're ready to talk about it, when they're ready to think about it, like that's really the goal, right? That's the, I think, the unique part 
of the approach is to help get your message out. And in today's world, not many people are using those, not as many people are using those techniques as should be. So in our programs, if we use them, it'll be a little bit more distinctive, a little bit more engaging, and we'll be able to get some of the messages out into the, uh, uh, into the world and hopefully uh, you know, get more engagement and get the change we seek. Excuse me. So a lot of this, if I go f like a couple um, years in the future, right this moment, I think the effort to do what I'm talking about has dropped an order of magnitude in the past you know, four or five years, whatever it happens to be. I think it's gonna drop another order of magnitude as we go, as this becomes more per pervasive. I think it's really still rapidly evolving and you can kind of see that from all the different um, competitors in the market and all the different tools available, all that kind of thing. It's, it's still an evolving um, pace. I, for me especially, talking to Japan colleagues, I, I think um, meetings can occur over time to a certain extent. I can say, hey, how are you doing? This is what I was thinking uh, in my time zone. And then um, my colleague in Japan will watch, the same, watch that video and give a response, and it'll be just like a conversation, but sort of separated by 12 or 14 hours, right? Just as easy, I mean, again, we're competing against email, but you have to, um, I would say, as the effort drops, it will make good sense to be able to have this kind of um, conversation that extends over time instead of in place as much for relationship building, as much for kind of adding the body language and kind of the context to it. Um, certainly, any, we can't stuff anything more in email, like email is, is essentially dead. Um, meetings, I think the, I, I don't know if you've seen the um, uh, kind of pair programming uh, idea where um, one person is watching over the shoulder of the other as they code to try to uh, uh, solve a problem, create a bit of code. I, I, I wonder, it would be super interesting to have a person who's solving a problem in data quality or in data management um, on a kind of screen grab or a video. I think it would be helpful to other people to kind of get snippets of the effort they go into. What's the detail they go into? Where do they access? What do they think? Showing how they solve the problem, uh, I think will help other people understand why this is hard. We, a lot of the reason why some of this is hard is because you know, on the surface it all sounds easy. You have to dig two or three levels before the, uh, uh, the issues start to appear and making that a little more visible uh, I think is important. And training materials, you know, as we uh, begin to get a, uh, a body of work around a project, around an event, uh, I think having that will be a way to have uh, new team members come up to speed in the sort of tribal culture. You know, what, what has happened? What's the history? Why is this like it is? And I think that's another uh, as this becomes more prevalent, another way this will uh, uh, move out. So that's most of essentially the, the main points I wanted to make. I did try to leave a couple of moments for two things. I can, if you want, show a couple examples uh, up to you. Uh, and of course, if there are any questions. So let's, go ahead. Yes, we have an, uh, it's like a, a separate thing, but putting them together is kind of where we are. But like we're in the first step of all of that, right? But yeah, combining them is a great idea. Hey, won't you spend just as much time creating this video, editing, and doing all that stuff as you would have just doing it in a meeting and having a subsequent meeting? It depends. Yes, but, right? So when I've, it took me a couple tries to kind of evolve this. Uh, as I was going, uh, if it's one or two other people in the meeting, right, then you're right. It's, you know, have the meeting be done, right? The meetings I have been uh, 
kind of uh, facilitate, facilitating might be 15 or 20 people. So in that case, I'm using it as a technique to get me to stop talking and get them to understand my messaging and then let them spend time uh, talking. So there are, it is not appropriate for all situations, but status meetings, but that example, couple, you know, five, 10 people where I'm spending a little bit more time, but I'm taking, you know, 15 times 30 minutes out of that meeting for the group. It's that kind of uh, use case that I'm looking at. That's a great point, and I think just the line you mentioned earlier around training is well, very similar to what you were doing training. Exactly. Exactly right. So this is just a, this is informal training, right? This is trying to, uh, training that we see in the corporate world, people put, you know, 100 hours into every one hour of video, uh, every, every video that we see along with everything else. This is more like um, uh, something more informal. We can do it now ourselves. We don't have to wait for the, the training group. But, you know, that's a good kind of, informal training is kind of a good uh, uh, way to look at this. I sure certainly can. Go ahead. I, I do formal training with videos, expecting people watch them when it's better for them and just come to live sessions with questions. And my experience is that they don't find time to watch the videos. You're 100% you're right. There's a flipped classroom, if you've seen that. Um, it's an educational concept where they do um, uh, solve the problems in the class and do the materials outside of class. But it is a culture change to ask people to watch the, the uh, videos. Okay, let's flip over now like we we're gonna do. All right, so I'm gonna give you four examples. I'm not gonna make you sit through more than enough to understand it. And I'm going to tell you kind of which technique in the ones that I had used. How am I doing? Seven minutes, cool. Um, so this is as simple, uh, well, I won't, uh, I will pause it there. Pause, pause. Um, there it is. Um, so for this one, uh, I simply recorded the meeting, right? So I did have the consent of the folks in the screen, right? So don't anybody go talk to my legal. Um, the, so this one was as straightforward as it goes. Just get two people on, the, on any one of the common meeting uh, view, uh, and then your, your face appears and your content appears uh, in, in what you're talking about from a share screen. So that's the simplest, most direct method. Um, Teams Live, we're in at Microsoft Shop, um, so I'm gonna show you this just to, to keep an idea. This was also super incredibly easy. So in the same deal, in this case, it's really built for a bigger use case for uh, managing uh, conference style, like bigger presentations, but it works perfectly to give my, you know, you can see me, you can see my content, super easy to spin up and super easy to record and, and put down. Um, in fact, Teams just did a rollout, if you use Teams, where they have this floating head approach uh, right, right built into it. Uh, so this next thing I, I'll show you. So I have been experimenting with the, the gamer one. Okay. So you can see in the, using the Streamlabs, uh, I won't try to solve that. Using the Streamlabs, I did get myself a little um, green background and the, the software just edited out my background and I can be a little floating head down in the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint and talk through the materials. So people see the materials, people see me react. Super simple to do. Now this one took me a bit to kind of figure out and understand, but once I did it, right, then it's only, uh, you know, I didn't look for perfection. Like I'm not writing a script for the whole of it. I'm trying to be conscious about talking clearly, consistently. I take one or two tries at it and I call it good enough, right? I'm not trying to be um, uh, an Academy Award winner here. I'm just trying to be good enough to convey the idea. Um, so that one, I, I just, I really thought that was a clever tool and, and I think the, the floating head really got a good um, 
reception. And I'll tell you, it, it drew people in, right? So other people weren't doing it. It gave me the opportunity to be a little bit different. And then they watched the message, which was the whole point of the exercise. And the last one, there are a, a number of um, very simple programs. This one's Doodly. Um, and this one I didn't do myself. Uh, a, a lady was helping me do it. Uh, but it, essentially, very short, one to two minute video, teaser trailer. It is no more than an attention grabber to be able to get people to go to the site and go to the place I want them to, to start to think about that. Um, it's doodly if you're interested. Um, so those are the couple examples along the spectrum of the tools I showed you. I'm, I'm good with that. That's all I got. Questions, comments? Do you have, a, have you come up with like a time frame on the video? Like how long is too long for a video? 15 minutes. It, you, um, I, I've, I've done 23, 30, gone back and forth. People, 15 minutes. Then even though they'll sit in a meeting for an hour, 15 minutes, and preferably two, three, four minutes. Yeah, I've been doing them at three minute lengths and calling them data bytes. It, it, and out just little one topic, little videos, and it's been good. I think that's the way to do it. I think you're absolutely right. Like I, I, w I was looking to replace meetings, but um, I think that's absolutely the right way to do it. Like short attention span theater, right? You just really, you want to get the message and move on, a message and move on. If you do, 50 small bites versus one, um, it's better received. But one five, 15 minutes seems to be, people stop. Good? Thank you very much, I appreciate it.